right, folks. Page 279, Hoot. Remember, um, the newspaper reporter had just come to speak with Roy. So, here we go. <clears throat> I'll just I remember she was talking and then Roy's dad interrupted and said, Hey, can I talk to my son real quick? So, she said, Absolutely. Um, so, Mr. Eberhardt brought Roy inside and closed the door. Roy, you don't have to answer any of her questions, but... I just want her to know. Here, give her this. Roy's father clicked open his briefcase and removed a thick manila folder. What is it, Dad? She'll figure it out. Roy opened the folder and broke into a green. This is the file from City Hall, isn't it? A copy, said his father. That's correct. The one with all the Mother Paula stuff. I tried to find it, but it wasn't there, Roy said. Now I know why. Mr. Eberhardt explained that he had borrowed the file, Xeroxed every page, and then taken the material to some lawyers who were experts in environmental matters. So does Mother Paulus have permission to bury the owl's dens or not, Roy asked. What was in the file? <sighs> his father shook his head. Nope. Roy was exultant, but also puzzled. Dad, shouldn't you be giving this to somebody at the Justice Department? Why don't... Why do you want me to hand it over to the newspaper? Because there's something there that everybody in Coconut Cove ought to know, Mr. Eberhardt spoke in a hushed and confidential tone. Actually, it's what isn't there that's important. Tell me, Roy said, and his father did. When Roy opened the front door again, Kelly Colfax was waiting with a perky smile. Can we continue our interview? Roy, Roy smiled brightly in return. Sorry, but I'm running really late for school, and he held out a file. Here, this might help you with your story. The reporter tucked her notebook under one arm and snatched the folder from Roy's hands. As she thumbed through the documents, the elation on her face dissolved into frustration. What does all this mean, Roy? What exactly am I looking for? I think it's called an EIS, Roy said, reciting what his father had told him, which stands for Environmental Impact Statement. Right, of course, the reporter said. Every big construction project is supposed to do one. That's the law. Yeah, but Mother Paula's EIS isn't in there. You're losing me, Roy. Well, it's supposed to be in that file, he said, but it's not. And that means the company never did one, or they lost it on purpose. Ah, Kelly Colfax looked as if she'd just won the lottery. Thank you, Roy, she said, embracing the folder with both arms as she backed down the steps. Thank you very, very much. She should be thanking him. He basically did her job for her. <sighs> Don't thank me, Roy said under his breast. Thank my dad, who obviously cared about the house, too. Epilogue, page 82. 282. During the following weeks, the Mother Paula's story mushroomed into a full-blown scandal when the missing environmental impact statement made the front page of the Gazette and ultimately proved the final fatal blow to the Pancake House project. It turned out that a thorough EIS had been completed and that the company's biologists had documented three mated pairs of burrowing owls living on the property. In Florida, the birds were strictly protected as a species of special concern, so their presence on the Mother Paula's site would have created serious legal problems and a public relations disaster if it had become widely known. Consequently, the, envir impact, the environmental impact statement conveniently disappeared from the city files. The report later turned up in a golf bag owned by the councilman, Bruce Grandy, along with an envelope containing approximately $4,500 in cash. Councilman Grandy indignantly denied that the money was a bribe from the pancake people. Then he rushed out and hired the most expensive defense lawyer in Fort Myers. Meanwhile, Kimberly Lou Dixon quit her TV role as Mother Paula, declaring that she couldn't work for the company that would bury baby owls just to sell a few flapjacks. The climax of her tearful announcement came when she displayed her life membership card from the Audubon Society, a moment captured by Entertainment Tonight, Inside Hollywood, and People Magazine, which also published a picture of Kimberly, Lou, Roy, and Beatrice hand-in-hand -hand at the owl protest. It was more media attention than Kimberly Lou Dixon had received as the Miss America runner-up, or even as the future star of Mutant Invaders from Jupiter 7. Roy's mother kept track of the actress's soaring career in the show business columns, where it was reported that she'd signed a movie deal to appear in the next Adam Sandler movie. By contrast, the owl publicity was a nightmare for Mother Paula's All-American Pancake House Incorporated, which found itself the subject of an unflattering front-page article in the Wall Street Journal. Immediately, the price of the company's stock began sinking like a stone. That's not good. After going wacko at the groundbreaking ceremony, Chucky Muckle got demoted to the post of Assistant Junior Vice President. Although he did not go to jail for choking the newspaper reporter, he was forced to take a class called How to Manage Your Anger, which he failed, and soon after, he, does, he resigned from the Pancake Company and took a job as a cruise director in Miami. 
In the end, Mother Paulus had no choice but to abandon its plan to put a restaurant on the east corner of on the corner of East Oriel and Woodbury. There was a nagging headline about the missing EIS, the embarrassing resignation of Kimberly Lee Dixon, the TV footage of Chuck Munkle throttling Kelly Colflex, and last but not least, those darn owls. Everybody was upset about the owls. NBC and CBS sent film crews to Trace Middle School to meet the student protesters as well as the faculty members. Roy lay low, but he later heard from Garrett that Miss Hennepin had given an interview in which she praised the kids who took part in the lunchtime protest and claimed she had encouraged them to participate. Roy was always amused when grown-ups lied to make themselves look more important. He wasn't watching TV that evening, but his mother burst in to report that Tom Brokaw was talking about him and Beatrice on the network news. Mrs. Eberhardt led Roy to the living room just in time to hear the president of Mother Paula's promise to preserve the Coconut Cove property as a permanent sanctuary for the burrowing owls and to donate $50,000 to the Nature Conservatory. We want to assure all our customers that Mother Paul's remains strongly committed to protecting our environment, he said, and we deeply regret that the careless actions of a few former employees and contractors may have put those unique little birds in jeopardy. Hmm, whatever, Roy muttered. Roy Andrew Everhart. Sorry, Mom, but the guy's not telling the truth. He knew about the owls. They all knew about the owls. Mr. Everhart muted the television set. Roy's right, Lizzie. They're just covering... Well, the important thing is, you did it, Roy's mother told him. The birds are safe from the pancake people. You should feel great about that. I do, Roy said, but it wasn't me who saved the owls. Mr. Eberhardt came over and put a hand on his son's shoulder. You got the word out, Roy. Without you, nobody would have known what was happening. Nobody would have showed up to protest the bulldozing. Yeah, but it all started because of Beatrice's stepbrother, Roy said. He's the one who should have been on Peter Brokaw or whatever. The whole idea was his. I know, honey, Mrs. Everhart said, but he's gone. Roy nodded. Sure looks that way. Mullet fingers had lasted less than 48 hours under the same roof with Bonnet, who spent most of that time on the telephone trying to drum up more TV interviews. Lana had been counting on her son to keep the Leap family in the limelight which is the last place he wanted to be. With Beatrice's assistance, the boy had snuck out of the house while Lana and Leon were arguing about a new dress that Lana had purchased for $700 in anticipation of appearing on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Nobody from Oprah's program ever called Lana back, so Leon demanded that she return the dress and get a full refund. Without the leaps shouting, uh, when the leaps shouting reached the same approximate decibel level of a B-52, Beatrice lowered her stepbrother out of a bedroom window. Unfortunately, a nosy neighbor had mistaken the escape for a burglary in progress and had notified the police. Mullet fingers made it only two blocks before speeding patrol cars surrounded him. Lana had been furious to learn her son was up to his old runaway tricks. Out of spite, she told the officers that he'd stolen a valuable tow ring from her jewelry box and demanded that he be locked up in a juvenile detention center to teach him a lesson. Mm. There, the boy had only lasted 17 hours before breaking out, and this time with an unlikely accomplice. <laughs> Hiding in the laundry basket with his new best friend, Dana Matherson, undoubtedly had no clue that he'd been sp he had been specially selected to join the jailbreak, that the scrawny blonde kid knew exactly who he was and all the rotten things he'd done to Roy Everhart. Being of simple mind, Dana probably had thought only of this his unexpected good fortune as the laundry basket was loaded into the laundry truck, which was then driven out of the gates of the detention center. Even when the even the approaching sirens probably hadn't worried him until the truck braked and the back doors flew open. It was then the two young fugitives leaped from the smelly bundle of dirty clothes and made a run for it. Later, when Roy heard the story from Beatrice, he knew instantly why her stepbrother had chosen Dana Matherson as an escape partner. Mullet Fingers was fleet and slippery, while Dana was sluggish and sore-footed, still not fully recovered from his encounter with the rat traps. The perfect decoy. That was Dana. Sure enough, the police had easily caught up with the big thug, though he shook off two officers before eventually being tackled and handcuffed. By then, Beatrice's stepbrother was a distant blur, a bronze-colored wisp vanishing into a snarled tree line. The police never found him, nor did they search particularly hard. Dana was the prize catch, the one with the rap sheet and the bad attitude. Roy couldn't find mullet fingers either. Many times he'd ridden his bicycle to the junkyard and checked the JoJo's ice cream truck, but it was always empty. Then one day the truck itself vanished, dragged off and pressed into a rusty cube of scrap metal. Beatrice Leap knew where her stepbrother was hiding, but he'd sworn her to secrecy. Sorry, Tex, she told Roy. I made a blood promise. So yes, the kid was gone. And Roy knew he'd never see Napoleon Bridger again, unless he wanted to be seen. 
He'll be all right. He's a survivor, Roy said for his mother's benefit. I hope you're right, she said, but he's so young. Hey, I've got an idea. Roy's father jangled his car keys. Let's go for a ride. When the Eberharts arrived at the corner of Woodbury and East Oriole, the two other vehicles were already parked at the fence gate. One was a squad car. The other was a blue pickup truck. Roy recognized both of them. Officer Delinko had stopped on his way home from the police station where he'd received another commendation from the chief, this time for aiding in the recapture of Dana Matherson. Leroy Curly Brannett, who was temporarily between jobs, had been driving his wife and mother-in-law to the outlet mall when he decided to make the brief detour. Like the Eberharts, they come to see the owls. As dusk fell, they waited in a friendly and uncomplicated silence, though there was plenty they could have talked about, except for the fence with its fading streamers. The land bore no sign to the pancake house people that had ever been there. Curly's trailer had been towed, the earth moving machines hauled away, the travel and Johnny's returned to the toilet rental company. Even the survey stakes were gone, uprooted and carted off with the trash. Gradually, the night air filled with the buzz of crickets, and Roy smiled to himself, remembering the box full that he'd released there. Obviously, the owls had plenty of other bugs to eat. Before long, a pair of birds popped out of the nearby burrow, and they were followed by a wobbly-legged youngster that looked as fragile as a Christmas ornament. In unison, the owls rotated their, un their onion-sized heads to stare at the humans who were staring at them, and Roy could only imagine what they were thinking. I gotta admit, Curly said with a fond grunt, they're kinda cute. One Saturday after the Mother Paula scandal had died down, Roy went to watch Beatrice and her friends play a soccer game. It was a sweltering afternoon, but Roy had resigned himself to the fact that there was no change of seasons in South Florida, only mild variations of summer. And though he missed the crisp Montana autumns, Roy found himself daydreaming less often of that place. Today the sun lit up the green soccer field like a neon carpet, and Roy was happy to peel off his t-shirt and bake. Beatrice scored three goals before she noticed him sprawled in the bleachers. When she waved, Roy gave her two thumbs up and chuckled because it was pretty funny. Beatrice the bear waving at Tex, the new kid. The high sun and the steaming heat reminded Roy of another bright afternoon so not so long ago. In a place not so far off, before the soccer match ended, he grabbed his shirt and he slipped away. It was a short ride from the soccer field to the Hidden Creek, and Roy chained his bike to a gnarly old stump and picked his way through the tangled trees. The tide was very high, and only a weather-beaten wedge of Molly Bell's pilot house showed above the waterline. Roy hung his sneakers on a forked limb and swam out toward the wreck, the warm current nudging him along. With both hands, he grabbed the lip of the pilot house roof and hoisted himself up on the warped bare wood. There was a there was scarcely enough space for a dry perch. Roy lay on his belly, blinked from the salt in his eyes, blinked the salt from his eyes, and waited. The quiet wrapped around him like a soft blanket. First, he spotted the T-shaped shadow of the osprey crossing the pale green water beneath him. Later came the white heron gliding low in futile search of a, sh of a shallow edge to wade. Eventually, the bird lifted, lighted halfway up a black mangrove, squawking irritably at the sound about the high tides. The elegant company was welcome, but Roy kept his eyes fastened on the creek. The splash of a feeding tarpon upstream put him on alert, and sure enough, the surface of the water began to shake and boil, and within minutes a school of mullet erupted. erupted. Sleek bars of silver shooting airborne again and again. Atop the pilot house, Roy scooted forward as far as he dared, dangling both arms. The mullet quit jumping, but assembled in a V-shaped squadron that pushed a nervous ripple down the middle of the creek toward the Molly Bell. Soon the water beneath him darkened, and Roy could make out the blunt-headed shapes of the individual fish, each swimming frantically for its life. As the school approached the sunken crab boat, it divided as cleanly as if it had been sliced by a saber. Quickly, Roy picked out one fish and, teetering precariously, plunged both hands into the current. And for one thrilling moment, he actually felt it in his grasp, as cool and slick and magical as mercury. He squeezed his fingers into fists, but the mullet easily jetted free leaping once before it rejoined this fleeing school. Roy sat up and gazed as his dripping at his dripping empty palms. Impossibly thought nobody could catch one of those darn things barehanded, not even Beatrice's stepbrother. It must have been a trick, some sort of clever illusion. A noise like a laugh came out of a dense knotted mangrove. Roy assumed it was the heron, but when he looked up he saw that the bird had gone. Slowly he rose shielding his brow from the sun's glare. That's you, he shouted. Napoleon Bridger, is that you? Nothing. 
Roy waited and waited until the sun dropped low and the creek was draped in shadows. No more laughing sounds came from the trees, and reluctantly he slid off the molly bell and let the falling tide carry him to shore. Robotically, he got into his clothes, though when he reached for his shoes, he saw that only one was hanging from the fork bow. His right sneaker was missing. Roy put on the left sneaker and went hopping in search of the other. He soon found it half submerged in the shallows beneath the branches where he figured it must have fallen. Yet, when he bent to pick up the shoe, it wouldn't come loose. The laces had been securely entwined around a barnacle-encrusted root. Roy's fingers trembled as he undid the precisely tied clove hitch knots. He lifted the soggy sneaker and peeked inside. There, he spied a mullet no larger than a man's index finger, flipping and splashing to protest its captivity. Roy emptied the baby fish into his hand and waded deeper into the creek. Gently, he placed the mullet in the water, where it flashed once and, and vanished like a spark. Roy stood motionless, listening intently, but all he heard was the hum of mosquitoes and the low whisper of the tide. The running boy was already gone. As Roy laced on his other sneaker, he laughed to himself. So, the great bare-handed mullet grab wasn't a trick. It wasn't impossible, after all. Guess I'll have to come back another day and try it again, Roy thought. That's what a real Florida boy would do. The end. Long one today. Great book. Good choice, Mr. Sewell. Very good choice. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, if you've actually tuned in for these. Hope you enjoyed it. And have a good day.